Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Brandon Muramatsu. Welcome to the 2012 iCampus Student Prize Final Presentations. Um, Vijay, if you could come up and say a few words about the iCampus program, some of its history, and kind of where, where we got to today. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have uh, people who are uh, Hal Abelson and Paul Oka. Uh, uh, and uh, we uh, were very, actually, very happy to have launched this program many, many years ago. Uh, seems like a long time ago, the iCampus program, which was a partnership between MIT and Microsoft Research. And it really spawned a lot of very, very exciting uh, education technology initiatives, some of which still live uh, in different ways. The iLab project, the spoken media browser, I mean, lots of stuff that's come on. And in fact, when we see the current uh, uh, set of uh, initiatives that are being launched now, we can trace their roots in one of the iCampus initiatives that were launched then. One of the interesting things about the whole iCampus initiative was a whole bunch of student projects that were launched at that time. And uh, I remember we used to have just like this, uh, students would come and make the proposals and the presentations, and that was the most exciting part for us you know, uh, of the whole uh, initiative. When, uh, uh, the init when the program ended, you know, and like I said, it was a very significant initiative, uh, Microsoft Research, it was a $25 million uh, program. And uh, when the program was uh, closing up, uh, there was some residual money left. And uh, through the efforts of Hal and Paul, uh, what uh, we decided was that uh, uh, we would uh, put this money aside in an, an endowment, and the interest from it, we'll, we know we would initiate a program that you guys are participating in, where students would be encouraged to, uh, you know, uh, what we see in students here at MIT all the time, you know, exploit their creativity, their ingenuity, and come up with, with projects, projects that are not only uh, significant for improving learning and living at MIT, but might have implications beyond, you know. And that's the genesis of this whole wonderful initiative that, that you know, and we're very proud the way it's, it's, it's grown. Uh, the last two years, uh, Brandon has been sort of uh, operating the program, you know, and uh, the last two years, we've also changed the flavor of the program. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we used to scout around for good initiatives. You know, now it's more in the nature of a competition that you guys are participating in, and uh, so that's a little bit about the history of the program. We're going to see much more. Uh, I know there'll be lots of opportunities to, to thank you and congratulate you for the wonderful work you've been doing. Uh, anything you want to add, Al? As a father of the program, we like to think about iCampuses. <laughs> I, th I think this really came out of uh, the, I think the initial ideas that Microsoft and, and MIT and faculty would get together and do, and do all sorts of great things, and we, we did. But at one point, it became obvious that the really innovative stuff was the stuff that the students were thinking about. So all through the iCampus program, we gave grants directly to students, and then when we finally when we finally terminated the program, and as Vijay said, we had money left, we thought that the, the right way to, to leave a legacy of it was to actually endow enough money for a prize. So this prize will go on for a pretty long time. And just every year, looking at what students are doing. And you guys are sort of the proof of that. I was really impressed by what I, what I saw uh, an hour ago. And let's, let's see what you have to do now. It's great. Paul, any comments? <laughs> All I want to do is uh, <laughs> all I want to do is say uh, thank you to all the student teams for uh, the time and effort. I know it's not easy. You all have busy schedules. Uh, I know a lot of the development and coding and and thought process was done at night, probably from uh, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the glory of having a deadline. <laughs> so um, I. Just want to thank everybody for all the hard work and, and looking forward to seeing the uh, fruits of your labor. Thank you. So we've heard from three of the judges. Uh, we have two more in the room. One is Oliver Thomas from ISNT, and then Jim Kane from OEIT. I will be judging also. Who knows if I will actually throw my, my votes in or not. Um, so without further ado, uh, Danny, if you want to come up and, and talk to us about uh, Course Road. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold, so forgive me. Um, hi, I'm Danny Ben-David. I'm a freshman here at MIT. 
And uh, my project is Course Road, which is an undergraduate course planner for the four years here. Um, I got the idea basically starting back in last August when I sat down and said, oh boy, I heard about all these awesome classes. I can't take them my freshman year. I'll go look at what they require. And I just started reading through the list, and then there's all these more numbers, and I'm like, okay, I'll look at those. And then those require other classes, and then pretty soon I realize I have to do handle with HASS and CI, and I'm having trouble keeping it all straight. So I'm figuring there has to be a better way. Now, in general, when you have an undergraduate degree, there's a bunch of different things that feature in. I couldn't keep track of CI from HASS, from LAB, from REST, from any of these things. And I was trying to find if there was some way I could kind of bring everything together. So I went looking. The closest you about get is in the registrar. The registrar provides something called the degree chart. Here are three. Um, as you can see, they're not the most user-friendly interface for determining what classes are recommended to take for a major. Um, my eyes glaze over when I look at these, and I had to look at all of them. Um, so I decided there had to be a better way. My answer was something I call Course Road. Course Road essentially creates a visual timeline down the page that provides a canvas on which users can place all of their undergraduate classes and immediately get visual feedback on how their requirements match up for each individual class and how they're doing on their major's requirements. So uh, you'll see each band across the page is a different semester. It just runs all the way down to senior year. And on the left-hand side, you have all of your GIRs. And then there's a drop-down box for your major as well, 50-something majors or something like that in there. Um, within about 30 seconds, I was able to add in all of my classes. Um, and you'll see that it's drawing all these random lines from one class to the other. Those are the prerequisite and co-requisite lines drawn inside of uh, Course Road, again, automatically and immediately. Um, they provide a very interesting way for you to view how your classes connect to each other. Um, there are a lot of cases where you can, you know, ASC or move out of a class, but this will still give you a general idea of what classes you're supposed to aim for for various things. Now, you'll also notice that one of my classes, I think it's my IAP class, yeah, is red on there. That's because I'm missing a class for that, I'm missing a prerequisite for that class. In this case, I need to require add permission for that class, which is something you can add uh, in the lower left. Now, um, yeah. In general, this, the, most of the computation taking place is in the browser itself. Uh, I have this nice, fancy, huge database that I've tucked away. I moved it over to scripts. Um, but uh, it's providing two services. It's holding all the catalog data, which I scraped, but will in the future move to the Course WS data warehouse uh, at IST. And it provides a place in which users can then save the roads they've created. Once you've added in your classes, you obviously don't want to do that every time. So you can, add, you can save your class either anonymously if you don't have certificate privileges, or if you do, you can actually save it with your username attached. Um, there's also an ability, once you're logged in, to then manage all the versions you've saved and go through them. Um, I feel like this could be an absolutely vital tool in the advising process in particular. I mean, I know I'm one of those people that loves to plan out multiple ways of doing this. What if I did this? What if I took that? What if I did this? Um, it helped me choose which major I was going to aim for. I'm probably going to end up double majoring in 6, 3, and 8. But in the meantime, I was trying to play with, yeah, I, I'm crazy, I know. Um, but um, I, it helped me play with, well, if I went this path, what classes would I end up taking? If I went that path, with path, which classes would I end up taking? So I've been using it myself, but it's been spreading among the undergraduate community because um, someone leaked it. Um, <laughs> um, but I find in an advising realm, if a student has an idea and they want to go share it with their advisor, instead of just listing off the classes, I want to take this, 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 and the advisor has to keep track in their head, oh, well, that requires this, and that'll satisfy that, just send them the link. Just Enter all the classes, email your advisor with the link. The advisor can load the link and say, hey, yeah, that works. Oh, you're missing this. You should add this. I recommend this class. Whatever. That's the general idea. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? How will you keep the, it'd probably be good for you to repeat the questions in the mic to sit up. Um, how will you, uh, keep things up to date with changes in various courses and degree requirements and all of that? Good question. So the, the question is, uh, how will I keep information up to date year by year? Because there are changes, well, more than, than I'd like, uh, in the catalog each year. Um, the plan is, in the near future, to move to the ISNT data warehouses version of all the course data, which is useful because it also stores previous years' worth of catalog information. 
Um, major requirements change year to year, but they're a less frequent basis, and that can be handled case by case. Um, but when catalog, if I can then import catalog data by year, I can then do something, a system, set up a system where I've, I've already had this issue um, come up with juniors and seniors who will say, hey, this class was different back in my freshman year. What, that'll, what can happen then is someone can say, oh, yes, well, you, you're importing the 2011 version of this class. Let me change that to the 2009 version of this class. And just by changing a small feature, people will be able to load older versions, and Course Road will just update accordingly. Yes. One difficulty, especially when you're a double major, is um, class conflicts when times and classes overlap with each other. So, is there, I mean, I guess it's a lot to ask, but is there a way to incorporate um, whether, you know, the, the timing of the classes, like, in the day? So um, there have been, I've noticed a plethora of entries in previous iCampus competitions about making sure cat class conflicts do not take place. I happen to have a, a friend, family friend connection with David Kanger, I believe is his name. He's the uh, one of the head leads behind the picker.mit.edu team. Um, soon I'm hoping to get in contact with him because what, what I'd love to do is provide the ability to, for instance, add classes for your next semester and then click a button. It'll run those all over to Picker and then tell you if you have any conflicts coming up. Uh, there's no there's no immediate plans to add uh, time data into the course road, but there are other services that do that plenty well. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, the question I already asked you: How many people have used this? What's your information? So um, I <laughs> I sent it out to maybe twenty or thirty beta testers, and then one of them had the really genius idea to show a friend who sent it to the ESP mailing list. And um, now, I, I haven't checked the numbers today, um, but as of yesterday, and it's growing very quickly, um, I've had approximately 1,000 page hits, which translates to maybe 300-ish users of the site, um, which then translates into maybe 90, 80 or 90 users who have logged in with their particular <laughs> Athena usernames, which then translates to 30 or so of those 90 who have actually used the site to as far as I've gotten it to work so far, which is um, actually log in and, and save something as a public road, which is what I call when you log in and then go to your managing your view roads and choose one to display publicly at you know, courseroad.mit.edu slash dannybd or whatever. Um, so yeah, and it's growing more quickly than those numbers. I can I can keep them straight. So yeah. Yes. So yes, um, the I mean obviously IAP doesn't exist at many other schools, but um, there's nothing ostensibly MIT dependent on the JavaScript running or the PHP and JavaScript all this all the code behind the site. What's dependent is you know the actual layout of how semesters work or the course data. Obviously, catalog is different. Um, I actually have spoken to some friends at some other colleges who have said, "Wow, I really wish I had this here." Um, one was at Columbia, one was at Harvard. Yes. Um, so. I don't see any inherent difficulty. Obviously, I'd have to work case by case because it's not just a drag and drop. Here's your catalog; it'll figure it out. Um, but there shouldn't be an, an, any overriding difficulties unless there's some radically different structure in how they deal with prerequisites or some other thing. If, it, if you have class, if you have a giant database of classes that you can take that have prerequisites for those classes, and you have requirements for your degrees, I hope you do. Um, <laughs> then course road should work. Can your database support multiple schools? Or would a school would have to host their own course road type, whatever? Well, I, I can imagine someone at, for instance, Columbia being kind of annoyed typing in course road.mit.edu each time. But um, I, I, I get your question. The, um, it would, yes. It would, require, it would require an extra row in two databases and maybe six extra characters on three separate lines in the, in the code. Other than that, it's not dependent on MIT, technically. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Ray. <laughs> I'm Sarah. And I'm Jessica. We're all seniors in Course 6, and we built Tango to improve the academic experience at MIT by connecting students, classes, and professors. Tango is a fusion of a social network and a question and answer forum where students can connect with classmates, ask questions about classes, give advice to other students, and give feedback to professors. So at MIT, we have a lot of problems that we have to deal with from day to day. And at Tango, we try to solve some of the problems that we just don't have 
time to do. To just give you a scenario, we have this character named Ben uh, <laughs> Bit Ditto. So. He, he's pretty famous in Core 6 P sets. Um, OK, so Ben Bit Diddle is stuck in the middle of choosing which classes to take. He's hoping to study with some of his buddies, so he asks which classes they'll take. They say, we're not quite sure, 602 or 034. We wish we could ask someone who knows a bit more. But wish as they may, and wish as they might, there's no upperclassman to ask in sight. So Ben says farewell and heads off to class, a lecture on atomic structure of glass. Ben gets confused. But the prof keeps going, not knowing that the knowledge was not really flowing. So at Tango, we try to solve some of these important questions that <coughs> students ask from year to year. There are two questions that, that people ask every time. It's, what classes I'm going to take next semester, and who am I going to take it with? So at Tango, we try to connect you with your friends who are potentially also interested in taking the same classes as you. So you guys can team up and potentially coordinate and figure out um, what, what kind of schedule you have, where you can meet up, when you have peace at parties. Um, the other question is, for professors, they really don't know what kind of feedback they're getting for their class, how well they're doing. And many times right now at MIT, our course evaluation is really inexact and vague, and students' voices oftentimes are somewhat unheard. So we want to really expose what the students think of the class to the general public. So classes are lower classmen who are thinking of taking the class, they can figure out, and just by looking at the website, they can know how, how well this class is doing, whether or not they might be interested in. So Tango started out as a course planning application, similar to Course Road, but we want to focus on a different aspect of the problem. So we're taking a social approach to academic life at MIT. Tango's social network leverages existing social aspects of academic life, like study groups, by centering around classes as a social unit. Students can build profiles showing which classes they have taken, are taking, and are potentially interested in taking in the future. They can also add their friends, view their friends' profiles, and find similar interests. They can very easily uh, coordinate classes to take together. They they can form study groups in their current classes, and they would know who to ask for advice. Students can even visualize their schedules on a map, and this makes it really easy to plan meetups on campus with your friends. And Tango also improves on MIT's course listings by showing not only the same information, but also um, the students who are taking each class. So w one of the features we're most excited about um, in our site is a question and answer component. So uh, one common problem is that students will ask the same questions over and over every semester. So every semester it's like, should I take 600 or should I take 601? I'm a freshman, I don't know, right? Um, what is the prereq, what is really the prereq for this class? So um, a lot of people have the same questions and could benefit from somebody just telling them once and for all. So we've built in um, one profile page for every single class. Um, you can see you can search for a question, and if it's not there, you can add it. Um, you can see the enrollment distribution. So people who are saying they're signed up, um, are they juniors, are they seniors? Um, we have, you can see who's the current students and past students. So in case you know any of them, you could probably ask them for help. Um, and followers are just people who are interested in taking it potentially in the future. Um, so at the bottom you can see, well, it's going to be like recent questions, and you can click in, into them. Um, so what a question page would look like, you can see the question on the top and number of answers, so people are allowed to upvote um, good answers uh, to provide basically crowd-based uh, quality assurance. And um, one thing that's nice about what we do is there's this thing you can actually see, timeless questions. Um, timeless questions are questions that are useful term after term. So presumably some questions might be, you know, should I take it this semester? Is the professor good? That wouldn't be really relevant down the line. But timeless questions would be like, what are realistic prereqs? Yeah. And so that's basically it. Our implementation is based on the logos you see here. 
we're HTML5 compliant. We're using Django for our backend on top of MySQL um, database and for the front end, we're using jQuery for the JavaScript and the library called Raphael to draw um, canvas objects. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So for enrollment data, initially when you launch the site, will you have enrollment data, or that gets built over time as users sign up? That would, uh, I guess, that would get built up as people sign up because we're not taking the data from like some other external source. Any other questions? <laughs> I have a question. Um, have you put any thought into um, privacy issues and how, and if so, how fine grained uh, we've put into some, some sort of security measures? You'd like to share information with other people, other uh, students, uh, but at the same time, you don't want stalkers and you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, so, yes, we've thought about privacy. We actually have one privacy setting right now which is either you're public to everybody on the site, so everybody can see what courses you've listed, or else you're private and it's just a checkbox. So if you're private, you're only visible to people who you've friended. So on friend relationships on our site are two-way, you have to friend and be accepted. So uh, that's our measure of security, because we did talk to people before designing the site, and that was one concern. Some people are very comfortable posting their uh, Facebook Putting, putting their schedules on Facebook, letting everybody see, whereas other students don't want to do that there. Yeah. And then an, an, another privacy feature is that you can ask a question anonymously, and I think answer anonymously. Yeah, yeah. And, comment. and comment anonymously on answers. Um, and furthermore, we also do registration by MIT certificates. So everyone who signs up will have to be in the MIT community. plans to basically solve the bootstrapping problem where you need to have a critical mass of people for this to be useful? Um, I mean, this website the service is for the community. If the community, and we know the community definitely has this need, it might not be as pervasive as every single student at MIT, just like how on websites like Quora or Google, only a couple, or Twitter, only a couple of people are producing the content. Um, so these are your producers, most people are your consumers. So we imagine probably a handful of upperclassmen per major who are contributing valuable answers or valuable questions to each class that will be passed down from semester to semester. And that alone will be enough to create a critical mass to make the website useful for all the populations. And then also, I guess another consideration for the future might be to connect with MIT directly to have access to those kind of statistics. Also, one thing to note is that as long as you and your friends are using it, it's fine. So you, it's not it's not the sort of site where you need like everybody to be on. You guys mentioned that you're all seniors, right? So what's going to happen next year? I'll still be around. <laughs> MNG. <laughs> yep. So what's what's your longer, longer term plan? Is the question for making sure that the site stays sustainable. Um, so one idea is to go talk to SIPB to try to get space to host this so that, you know, it can continue to stay at MIT. Otherwise, they're, like, we could host it on an external server somewhere. But we think it's a useful thing, and I personally am curious to see if people will use it and what they like about it and what they don't. Any thoughts about recruiting some undergraduates to help maintain and enhance the site? Do you guys want to talk? Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. Um, I guess we'll see after it takes off. Um, yeah, and then I'll be back here after a year off for M Engine PhD, so, yeah. Last question. Now, courses and some courses do have uh, sort of an informal student evaluation process going on already, right? So how does this map <coughs> Okay, um, so course six, you know, we have the HKN Underground um, Guide to help you see how difficult the course is and how students in general evaluated it, um, how interesting the course was to them. But if you look on the way, look at the website and how they compile their data, it, there's, 
it's all written by people who are in the HKN club, and they compile all the comments, all the um, ratings together into this one page that you see. But you know, like data fluctuates, I think, very quickly uh, with time. It's sensitive to your student population. So if you put such a hard cover on um, class feedback, then a lot of students, their voices will sometimes get overpower and at the end be unheard. Yeah, and I think like one of the um, really unique things about Tango is that it really just focuses on very interpersonal social interaction, like really building a community focused around, um, you know, this idea of peer advising, like mentorship, mentorship between students. Um, and so I think these like really personal comments, answers, um, will provide a lot more information than the existing course evaluation systems. Yeah, one thing to um, remember is just like, basically there's this problem of one size fits all with the course evaluations, a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics, but um, I've talked to professors and they don't even think that's very useful. Everybody just sees the number first and they're like, honestly, we hope people won't focus on that so much because what can that tell you about the class at all? Like if I'm a freshman with vastly different backgrounds, my experience of this class will be so different. So our, what we're trying to create is something that can help both sides of the population. Sorry, one more. Oh. <laughs> okay, so one, one more quick thing to add is that um, another really important thing is to have like real-time course feedback during the semester. Um, I mean, like I know in my classes, several professors have passed out like physical pieces of paper feedback forms to fill out in every lecture um, so that you know they can tailor their teaching to the current students um, and they've said that you know the, the course evaluation systems are really not that helpful because they only get it way after the fact um, and it's no longer applicable to the current students Thank you very much. Thank you. now MIT has a problem the problem is that students come here to study science, technology, engineering, and math, but then they go into banking, consulting, <laughs> finance, and business. Now that's clearly a problem because we live in a time where STEM fields are really important, but the attrition over a 10-year period for jobs is way too high. We think this might be because in STEM careers, internships are critical to the process since during an internship, you learn to apply the knowledge that you learn in class. But STEM labs have a really difficult problem, a difficult time attracting students to come work for them. Here's an example. Meet Dave. <laughs> Dave is a freshman <clears throat> who's just started at MIT. He wants to get his hands dirty and go do some real science in a real lab. <laughs> but the problem is to kind of explore his interests and eventually settle on a major. But the problem is, Dave has no idea where to start or where to go to. Right across from the street from Dave is Bob. Bob is a lab manager at an MIT research lab. He would love to have a year up to help him out on some work and mentor him, but he has no idea where the MIT students hang out. How can we connect Dave and Bob? Well, enter STEM ID. STEM ID is a web platform that facilitates hands-on le learning and mentorship via STEM internships. It contains hundreds of hand-curated links that are specifically targeted towards STEM fields. And we're trying to enable students to more easily find internships that match both their interests and their needs. Not only do we have highly relevant internship opportunities, but we put a lot of focus into the user experience to make the website really simple and easy to use. So let's follow Dave as he goes about his internship search. Dave goes to the STEM ID website and goes to search for internship. He's thinking of doing course study or biology at MIT. And genetics sounds like fun. So he types it into the search bar. A bunch of internships pop up, and Dave clicks on the MIT one, opening it up. He reads the description and it sounds interesting. So he scrolls down and clicks on the Biosite tab to find some other opportunities. However, Dave has a time constraint. It's April right now and he needs to narrow down the list of internships. 
applications, these application deadlines are not over yet. So he goes to the scroll bar and sends it to June, which is when his summer starts. Dave selects a couple of internships to compare side by side. And then he films them, saving them for later. He picks his favorite and clicks on the link, which leads him directly to the application page on the MIT website. Dave is well on his way to do cool assignments this summer. So all the entries you see are submitted through this easy to use form. Organizations can manage the details of their internship positions, as well as set their position dates and deadlines. Entries can be tagged through our specific system that correlates the tags with other published literature in the field, ensuring a high curation of data. Other cool features include auto-completion for organizations and locations, pulling the logo of the internship opportunity, as well as maps of where the location is. Now, STEM ID is running on PHP Fog and MongoLab in the back end to host the website files. We went with the platform as a service website because we wanted to skip the infrastructure scaling time or setup time and ensure that there's easy application scalability. We also chose to go with a NoSQL mo database called MongoDB um, to manage the data. This allows us to continue to evolve the data scheme without having to predefine the structure as in traditional relationship databases, such as MySQL. On the front end, we're running jQuery, jQuery UI, and Metaphysy for the dynamic, changing user interface. We chose Java because of its prevalence in a multitude of devices, including laptops, tablets, and mobile devices, such as your iPad. So moving forward, we're constantly adding new features. Right now, we're scaling up our internship offerings through self-submission, as well as Amazon's Mechanical Turk system, which we can use to outsource our input, as well as web scraping of academic websites and university collaborations with places such as MIT. We're looking for, to add feedback for multiple sources for each opportunity to improve the matching, as well as give better recommendations for what students really need. And finally, we want to continue to expand the mentorship of the website, helping to project and set milestones for projected career pathways, as well as connecting to members of the community, such as PIs and professors. At STEM ID, we see not just an opportunity, but a responsibility to connect students with labs in order to help students take control of their future. Thank you. I have a microphone, just Question. in case. You mentioned the stuff that is hand curated. Who's going to um, hand curate the list of recent customers? That's a good question. It's a combination of both our internal stuff. That's how this started, is that we curated links. But now it's moved on to lab administrators. So specific labs have a really high incentive to make the best offering possible, because they want students to be able to get you know, the full experience and all the information they need. So, you know, we've gotten a lot of buy-in from specific lab managers to curate the links um, and make sure that they're up to date. I think one of the problems that um, you might be referring to is, is something that we found too is that most of the times it's not actually the lab, uh, it's not actually the professors who actually add their own internships. It's usually you have administrators and secretaries um, and at the Broad Institute where I am, like it's, it's mostly um, administrative staff. And they don't know what the difference is between you know, chemical engineering and, and chemistry, for example. And, and so if we're promising something like a high, you know, a high quality curation, then that was a stumbling block for us. But one of the things that we came up with was a way to ensure that this quality remains high. And what we're doing is basically using um, bibliometrics and citation analyses from published databases like Scopus and Web of Science. And we're using these subfield annotations so that all you need is basically one tag. For example, if you're doing material science research and you enter just one tag, material science, because it's a material science lab, you get a suggestion of subfields based on bibliometric data out there that exists in the web. So um, material science would cite polymer papers, but would never cite, say, acoustics, for example. So in that way, you get 
just the administrator herself who gets to see, all right, these other tags are associated with, with this field, and, and that gets associated with the, the database entry. Any more questions? Good. Uh, can you talk, talk about how, um, I guess there are a lot of current offerings for just like finding internships in general. Um, and MIT students have like career fairs and that sort of thing. So can you talk, talk about like how do you see yourself against all of that? You sure. Know, like there was a career center. Repeat. Repeat the question. question. Oh, repeat the question. All right. Well, the question was, how do we see ourselves competing with all the other recruitment offerings for internships out there, including career fairs and monster.com? Well, one is that we have specifically curated for STEM internships, um, and specifically STEM internship labs. A lot of career fairs and you know, online commercial websites are filled with industry, so consulting, banking, or um, pharmaceuticals and petroleum <laughs> services. And the little guy, kind of the, the academic lab and the startup, kind of get drowned out. But here at STEM ID, you know, because we kind of have a focus on STEM, we have a lot more offerings that are more academically based. That, you know, these are people who wouldn't have the big budgets to come and recruit at a re recruiting, recruiting fair or hold info sessions because they don't have the manpower. And we're hoping that students who are really interested in doing this kind of research and this kind of you know, work will be able to find offerings that are more relevant for them here. Okay, maybe one last question. So you have this upfront matching process between people looking for internships and uh, scientists and uh, administrators, engineers, faculty. Um, is there any uh, post-internship follow-up that happens? A lot of programs have that internally, but it seems like there's a big opportunity to do that in a central way, how well expectations lined up, how well the, the curation actually worked in creating a match. Sure. Well, so the question was, is there any sort of post-internship follow-up or matching afterwards? Well, the cool thing about this system is that it's not just delimited to STEM internships for specific internships or specific fields. In fact, it's a platform in which you can expand past internships into possibly job offerings, or even before internships, the kind of high school programs. So, you know, say cool programs like Splash or Spark could implement things like this, and we could get a whole set of data from high school all the way to you know post college, and track a user as they move along there, um, as they move along kind of their career path and things like that. We're definitely not limited to just an internship, so. So we definitely have plans to build a uh, feedback system in the sense of once a student has completed an internship, um, what they, they become alumni of that internship opportunity basically. And what we're trying to do is also say, all right, we're not just you know, providing a way for you to find each other, but to actually improve that match. And what that means is, for example, some students thrive under you know, pro uh, mentors that are, they give them space, the autonomy to run their own projects. And some other students, they need to be micromanaged a bit. They, they tend to prefer more guidance or you know, they, they don't work well if left to their own devices. And if you can get al alumni to rate, for example, a, an objective rating after they've completed an internship on a scale of one to 10, how proactive was your mentor? How proactive was, your, was this experience for you? And, and in a way, have um, students who have their profile set up and their preferences, we can actually better, better match the emotional needs of a student to the characteristics of that particular internship. So there's a bit of a you know, feedback loop, but that's something that can only happen once we have people that actually go through the internships and rate them. Thank you guys very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Muji Jamal, and this is Connie Chan, and we developed a website called Casa Nexus. Uh, Casa Nexus is a website to promote connecting MIT students with alumni and parents to find housing uh, on a short-term basis, around a month or two, three months. This came about when both of us were considering applying to the alumni externship program, which if you haven't done before, it's a program that the Alumni Association offers that's over IAP, and it usually offers opportunities all around the world, or all around, mostly all around the country, but also all around the world, and they're either 
paid or not unpaid, there's housing or not housing offered or transportation, not transportation offered. Uh, one of the biggest concerns though for students considering the externship program is where they will stay because that's uh, pretty important if you're going to spend a month somewhere. But it's extremely hard to find somewhere to live for just one month and the current uh, way to do that would be to use Craigslist, which is not a very nice setup. And so after going through that experience, we decided to develop Casa Nexus. So yeah, this is a little bit of the background uh, that I just talked about. And okay, so we started off with a platform where you could, uh, as a, somewhat, as a student, the idea would be you'd be able to enter where you'd need to live and what sort of criteria you're looking to uh, when you're looking to when you're looking for uh, housing, whether you needed to pay or if you could pay, how much you could pay and afford, and sort of whether there was cats, dogs, things like that of that nature. And then you'd also be able to find on a map where uh, where the housing was and where you could click on it and see a little blurb about it, which again, none of this is available on Craigslist. Uh, and then for the alumni or the parent, they would be able to post far more easier than they would be on Craigslist a, their housing opportunity for a student uh, who wants to participate in an, uh, the externship program. And you know, there's the final output. Uh, the reason why our website is better than Craigslist, in addition to it being more streamlined, is it's a little bit safer because you're limited to the MIT community via certificates for MIT students and the Infinite Connection account for parents or alumni. Uh, as well as the convenience. And um, it's also promoting uh, closer contact throughout the externship program, which one of the goals is to connect alumni with uh, current students and just continue to foster the MIT community in general is part of the goal of the Alumni Association. So yeah, that's the website. And here's a bit about the implementation. Okay, um, so it's a website, so on the front end, it's, it's pretty standard like jQuery. Uh, we use Bootstrap, which is like a UI package. Um, and f instead of CSS, we write less CSS because it's faster. Um, and we also use HTML5, CSS3, um, Google Maps, because we map the results, uh, file picker IO for like uploading images for uh, your posting. And then in the back end, it's Ruby and Sinatra. Um, and it's all running on Amazon Web Services. Um, and uh, our database is MySQL. So, yeah. Were you going to talk about future plans? Oh, yes. Uh, and our future plans are to expand after uh, folks in the externship program to summer opportunities because that is also a nice uh, market where people could find cheaper housing than sometimes are, is available. And uh, this summer, we hope to have a beta launch with uh, the summer and uh, next IEP is when we would like to really see a large amount of uh, people have taken advantage of posting housing opportunities as well as finding housing opportunities. So she asked if this is a service where you, you're paying or whether you're, it's more of just giving back to the, whether uh, the student is paying for the housing or whether the uh, alumni or a parent is just giving it for free. Well, the idea is that um, in certain situations, maybe uh, the student might want to offer some sort of um, covering for the rent or the, uh, or, the, or utilities if they are spending part of the time there. But it's, the idea isn't to try and make money off of a student, but uh, to just sort of provide somewhere to stay that's, uh, that's safe and secure, but maybe the student would wish to give back a little to, the, to their host in case there may be a, a young alumni who might need more than uh, just giving away their home for free. Are you familiar with 
website called Airbnb? Yeah, we are. Um, we were sort of inspired by that, but I guess the difference between our website and Airbnb is that Airbnb tends to be more short term, even shorter than a month. And since most section trips are around a month, uh, it's a little bit still difficult to get someone, to, a random stranger, to share their home for a month. Whereas the uh, externship program is established as the month of IAP, which is January. Oh, sorry, the month of January, which is IAP for MIT. Do you, have, um, do you have any plans for, for instance, waiting? Like, there might be people who offer multiple times, but there are students who have awful experiences with FA or something like that. Or the other way around, is there anything system like that? Yeah, we're hoping to have uh, a s simple profile page for people who uh, post as well as uh, people who use it. Um, and so the, for the poster, you just see their room that they have available. And um, I guess any reviews anyone would have to say to comp leave a comment behind. We haven't really thought through the entirety of, I guess, sort of review process. Like, you don't want to be, I guess, too mean, but um, you do want to let people know the truth of, like, living with someone. And hopefully, we would be able to, um, like, hand select. Like, if someone is really not uh, being a good host or being a great student, then there are other ways to get back, sort of, to the process. Okay, so I. I think this is a cool idea, and this is kind of the uh, example of a site where it would be great if you have like a lot more users. So, have you thought about like integrating with maybe like we have friends from other schools, but you know, you probably teach your friends more than like in general the pool of all MIT alums ever. Like maybe having some sort of connection with just that kind of social networking. Yeah, so, I mean, we would also like to expand to other schools, and in particular, looking at San Francisco and sort of Stanford and the Stanford-MIT connection, um, especially because there's a lot of people who do tend to go there, and uh, probably equally as many people come here for different reasons. And uh, But I guess there are things that we need to work out, sort of how to make sure um, both people have access, like, because right now it's based on certificates and alumni connection, so you'd have to... We'd have to think about that a little more, which is sort of why we were putting that for our future plans. Yeah, and like another consideration is that um, if like an alumni knows someone who didn't graduate from MIT or like Stanford or whatever, but who have a lot of extra space, then like the alumni could sponsor that other person's account or just like, um, yeah, just like post their room for them. So you're still like within like the secure like university community, but you're not restricted to like affiliates only. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luke, and with me today is Drew, Alex, Cosmos, and Isaac. Uh, together, we make up the core development team for Dormbase. Dormbase is a modern framework for modern dorms. Today, we'd like to discuss three things. We'd like to go over our design philosophy, discuss some of the features that we chose to implement, and also give you a high-level technical overview of how Dormbase does what it does. Dormbase has three driving principles. The first principle is that we wanted everything dorm related to be in one place. Residents shouldn't have to go to multiple websites to get the information that they need. We also wanted it to be incredibly easy to use. So we spent a lot of time on the UI in terms of the layout and the design of the website. We've also done testing in ISNT's usability lab. Lastly, we wanted to use cutting edge web technology. So residents shouldn't have to go to any other site except for dorm base to get the information that they need. So three really good examples of this and uh, three kind of features that residents have really fallen in love with are laundry, dining, and tech shuttle. The information that you need should never be more than two clicks away. So an example of kind of intuitive, this web design, a really good use case is movies. So if you want to find a specific film to watch, you can either use the universal search feature and go straight to that movie, or you can come to the movies page and search by genre. So let's say you want an action film. You can look and see all of the movies that are in a dorms um, directory. And if, for instance, we want to watch, uh, let's say, Dark Knight, we pull in all of that information from other websites. So right now, we're scraping IMDb. If you want to reserve this film, you can reserve it from this page. And the desk will have it ready for you by the time you get downstairs. 
We also have administrative features. So that's like package management or guest list management. Um, if you need to do equipment, check in and check out, or you need to do housing or rooming lotteries, you can do that all with Dormbase. It's a complete package that gives a dorm everything it needs to operate. So Dormbase is built using the latest in HTML technologies. We developed the web frame or the front end using HTML5, so it's also completely mobile compatible. And Dorbase is powered by Django, which is the most popular web framework for Python. And we chose Python because most MIT students are familiar with Python, certainly Core 6. Now, Dormbase is a huge project, and we knew we couldn't do it alone, so we asked for help. The first thing we did was we built a community of people. We've partnered with SIPI, which is MIT's storied computer club, which has a great 60-year history of helping MIT with technical services. And the Dormbase is now an official SIPI project. Now, we've been fortunate, because we all live in Simmons, that we have been able to test Dormbase on the residents of Simmons. We've received a tremendous amount of feedback and support from people. It's really been encouraging, and uh, the, the feedback has just been tremendous. Um, we've been overwhelmed by support from other dorms. People see Dormbase, and they really like it. So it's just been fantastic. Now, Dormbase is a complete solution. It's able to run all by itself, but we've been careful to architecture it in a very modular way. So as more people get involved and they want to add new features, it could be installed as applications to just run on top of Dormbase. Very seamless, and we're really excited to see where Dormbase can go, really enhance the capabilities. Now, we'd like to really thank all the judges. You guys have been fantastic. Brendan, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Also, the Simmons residents have been fantastic. They've been very supportive of us. Uh, this has been a, a great project to work on and a lot of fun. So we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I have all these questions. Um, but I really like the site. It's really clean. I'm sure like, it's like really nice to use, right? And right now, BC, we're in Connor, where I live. Um, our site does like a lot of these things, but it just like looks a lot happier. Um, but one thing I, I was thinking, right, is that you tested in Simmons, and you're from Simmons. So there's a sense of like community, right? Like it belongs to us. And the same thing kind of like happened at Fort Commons. Like we have our own webmasters, and it gets passed on, and it gets built, and then, you know, there, there's updates. But it's always like dorm owned. Um, so do you have plans of, if you're trying to roll this out to the, uh, all the dorms, how will you um, convince people to get on board? Sure. Um, so the question is, how are we going to convince other dorms to get on board? Um, yeah. So what we've done is we've created a very powerful back end, but we recognize that every dorm on campus has a very distinct culture, and we in no way want to kind of override or influence that culture. So we provide a very clean interface for people to work with. So you write your own front end. Uh, we provide a, gener a kind of a generic theming, but you can do whatever you want with the front end. Um, but these services are already done. And for us, it was really about building a community of developers. So the services for all the residents go way up. Um, you don't have this really fragmented system anymore that you, know, you have to pass from generation to generation, uh, and that's especially something we've run into at Simmons. We've had to maintain a very old and fragile system that just doesn't work. Uh, and so we wanted to start fresh with something everybody could get involved in. Uh, and again, that's why we chose Python, so that you know, different people from different dorms can contribute and feel like they know enough to make a contribution. Also, our vision for Dormbase is really to be something that every MIT student has access to. Uh, so we started meeting with MIT Housing, the Division of Student Life, and ISNT. So this can really become a campus-wide project that's open source, everyone can contribute, but it's also centrally managed and maintains, really uh, enhances MIT's presence for all the dorms, gives the residents the services they need, it's something easy they can use, one-stop shop. And additionally, to address your concern of what, how do we get buy-in from other dorms, we've actually gone and talked to Next House, East Campus, Random, a few people in Burton Connor, and generally we've been told by them that, yeah, we'd love to use this, we just don't have time to help you contribute right now. And especially <coughs> in our conversations with housing, who really like the system, we've also strongly emphasized that we don't want everyone to have the exact same thing. We do want the theming so that the culture can continue to stand out. So, like we said, you can theme it, you can add your own apps, you can customize it, whatever you need. It's just going to be a common platform for everyone to use. Yes? So, for a dorm using this, what are the management issues? You know, the tech shuttle schedule changes, what do you have to do with the dining menu? <coughs> what, what do you have to do to manage this thing? You know, kind of 
Uh, so the question is, what does a dorm administrator have to do in order to manage the system from the day to day? And the answer is practically nothing. Uh, once you set it up, it should continue working as expected. Uh, if something breaks, uh, the upstream developers, uh, because this is a SIPI project, will fix it and push an update out where wherever this will be deployed, you would just have to do something as simple as running git pull, and you'll get the latest version of all of the code, and it will just fix itself. Uh, any sort of configuration or customization that the dorm may do itself would be outside of the scope, and they would have to work on it themselves. Any thoughts about making a mobile app? And what have you done in the back end to support that? Sure. So the question is about mobile apps. And because we're using uh, Twitter Bootstrap and a lot of jQuery and CSS3, uh, HTML5, it actually works really well natively right now <coughs> on the uh, iPhone as a web interface. Uh, that's actually a direction MIT is um, moving towards where I know for the, the uh, CPW app, they used to release different apps for Android and iPhone, but they're all moving to this standard unified uh, web app. So we actually think that's pretty good, and it just works natively right now on the uh, uh, mobile devices. It's something we definitely want to improve, uh, make things more you know, responsive for touchscreen interfaces. I'll take one more question. Um, just from a technology point of view, how do you guys plan on porting some of the personal data connected to each dorm, like the residents, um, their names, their emails, and the list of all the movies that each dorm owns? This is a huge undertaking. Uh, so the question is, how do we plan to do a bunch of data migration as uh, people come in? Our key philosophy here was really to have one central entry for data. So um, if you're, you know, new residents come in in the uh, fall, you want to just enter their name, where they live, what room they're in, uh, and then all everything else should work automatically. So we've put a lot of effort into making sure that mailing lists work automatically. If you're a freshman, you automatically get added to the freshman mailing list. That's something that currently doesn't happen in Simmons, and it's a manual process. You have to run uh, different batch jobs to get that to happen. What we'd like to, actually like to do, though, is integrate with housing. So all the information will just get come in automatically. If housing knows you live in Baker in room 357, it just automatically happens inside dorm base. So you don't ever have to enter that data. It just makes it really seamless. Uh, and in, in terms of movies, um, we have movie a movie chair, for instance, in Simmons, right? And so their job should be just to type something in. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to worry about the back end. And it should just work. And, and so now what you do is you just enter the IMDB ID. Uh, eventually, they'll just migrate to the actual title. And all that information gets pulled in. Uh, you know, they click one button, and it just works, and it's done. Okay. Great. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.